So thank you so much to everyone uh, for joining us today in National Hedgerow Week, especially all our volunteer tree wardens and our young tree champions and our supporters from all across the country. My name is Sarah Long and I'm CEO of the Tree Council, which is a national charity that brings everybody together for the love of trees and hedgerows. Uh, because it's National Hedgerow Week, uh, we're focused on hedges today, so important to us uh, and to wildlife for their homes, for the corridors they create, for birds and mammals and all sorts of other creatures. They are not only uh, in the countryside, of course, but really important uh, in cities as well. They provide shade, they clean the air we breathe, they help prevent flooding, uh, and the blossom and berries just make us all feel so much better. It's fantastic that the Tree Council has been able to support farmers and schools all across the UK to establish more than 53 kilometres of hedgerow last season, and we're hoping that we'll be planting lots more this autumn as well. So just before I introduce our first speaker, a bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, do please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat, um, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible at the end. We're delighted this evening to welcome the amazing Lucy Lapwing and Ian White. Ian is just hopefully joining us before too long. They, like Team Tree Council, are they love trees and hedgerows and all the different kinds of wildlife that live in them. And we're very honored to have two such incredible experts with us. Ian has been Dormouse Officer for People's Trust for Endangered Species for 16 years. He has awesome knowledge on everything that's Dormouse related. And Lucy is a self-described nature nerd. As well as taking part in Spring Watch, she uses Instagram in a really fun and informal way to engage people um, with the nature on their doorstep. So now, thanks to DEFRA and the National Lottery Heritage Fund, who are supporting us with a fabulous three-year grant for a hedgerow program, I'm going to invite you to settle back comfortably, and Lucy is going to tell us about why hedgerows make perfect homes for birds. Over to you, Lucy. Brilliant, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so if you could just let me know that you can see it, if that's yeah. all right, and then I can carry on. Um, that was a really lovely introduction, thank you. Um, here we go. Hopefully I'm not bringing any technical difficulties. Can you see? Okay. Yeah, we can see you. That's good. <laughs> Excellent, right. Well, let's get started. So um, I'm going to be covering the feathered side of things uh, this evening, and I'll leave it to Ian to cover the furry side. Um, hopefully he'll get some a um, bit more joy on his uh, technical difficulties he's been having. Um, so I'm just going to do a bit of an informal natter about um, hedgerows as a place, um, a place of excitement, a place of opportunity for wildlife, um, a really exciting kind of microhabitat in itself, and how that translates into the feathered things or birds um, that, that it helps support. So why a hedgerow is that kind of key thing that birds rely on so much um, and as well as that I'm going to kind of interweave a little bit of bird song lessons as well just because um, that's kind of my nerdy speciality I really like bird song um, so we're going to meet some characters of the hedgerow and then delve into the voices behind them as well. So first of all a little bit about me who am I why am I here well um, as Sarah said I am a self-described nature nerd so um, I, I'm very proudly wear the nerd title um, I'm kind of an informal naturalist, I'm self-taught, I have no massive scientific qualifications, I'm just somebody who's really passionate about British wildlife um, and I like to yomp around in the countryside or any green space I can find um, and find any living thing and then just work out who it is and what it does um, and a little bit about its ecology. So um, this is generally the kind of state you'll see me in. Um, I have to wash a lot of clothes because I'm always climbing something or lying on the floor or observing something. Um, that bottom picture, I just found uh, my first ever lesser stag beetle, so I was really excited about that. I think the first picture was my first um, wooden enemy of the year. Again, plant really excited. Um, and this one involved me breaking my glasses because I was so excited that I saw a really cool slime mold inside of this rotting log. Um, so for me, it's not just about birds. I'm not just a bird nerd. I like everything from bugs to fungi to wildflowers to trees, um, everything in between. And I think my spirit animal is actually the common toad. I absolutely love this common toad. So I like a little bit of all British wildlife and I like to 
bang the drum about how exciting it is because we tend to think wildlife is something that you find in far flung corners of the world and um, big sexy stuff like tigers and whales and elephants. Um, but in the UK, we have some really exciting flora and fauna. And just because it's small doesn't mean it's not really, really cool to see. So generally, when I go about nature nerding, how I do it um, as a verb, um, I explore all different types of habitats. So I'll go on a walk and just kind of look for the places that might yield something living and something exciting. So here, it's something wet. I can find treasures like newts, amphibians. I absolutely love, like I said, I just love toads. Um, anywhere where there's rotting dead wood, so trees and forests and woodlands, anywhere where there's any kind of tree life or tree death, because the death is as important as the life, is a place that I can find wildlife. Um, this is a really cool um, type of puffball fungus that I was just giving a good prod to. Um, any kind of moist and damp and dark places, so under rocks and that kind of thing, I might be likely to find some cool critters like mollusks and slugs. Um, one of the things I love about nature is finding that the gross and the weird stuff and banging the drum about those underdogs. It's not just all about the cute and the sexy. Um, and anywhere where there's a, a floral diversity, um, and I'm delving into the world of botany at the moment. Um, so things like hedgerows and woodlands and trees are really exciting places to get to know all of our different plant species and then all the species that are therefore associated with those plants. Wildflower meadows being one of those places. Um, you can find all sorts of stuff like these gorgeous burnet moths who are um, getting it on and <laughs> producing using the next generation of moths. So, two hedgerows. Um, now, this is a bit of a scribbly drawing that I did um, that I've kind of expanded on, so forgive me, it's a little bit all over the place. And the yellow hammer has lost a foot, I've just noticed on the brambles, so that was my oversight, I apologise. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how hedgerows support bird life. Um, so, what are these features in our landscape and how do they actually help the feathered friends that live in them? Um, now, you might recognise a few species in there, well, in this photo, both plant and the bird, um, but I'm going to delve into them in a little bit more detail. So what I've tried to draw in this uh, diagram here is an example of kind of, you know, this is one stretch of hedgerow, but how a hedgerow can range from a poorly managed hedgerow to a well-managed hedgerow. And that's because hedgerows are managed features in a landscape. They're a human feature. Um, they're something that we've used in the past for thousands of years years, hundreds of years, um, and it's something that we would have used in traditional small field farming, um, really, really small pastures that we would have had livestock in, and we would have had this thick, thorny, impenetrable barrier around the outside. Effectively, nature's wall is what a hedgerow is. It's where we've planted certain types of thorny trees, thorny bushes, and all the other different types of plants to create an impenetrable barrier to our livestock, so things like cows and sheep can't get through it. Um, it demarks land, it demarks where um, a boundary is, um, and it's just a really important feature that provides not just that, that kind of physical barrier to livestock moving, but also shelter as well from wind and bad weather. Um, and if you think about these, these features in the past, they would have had to have been maintained, otherwise it meant that your livestock got away. So it was uh, you know, part of managing a farm, that, that hard, grueling, difficult task um, was to keep your hedgerows in these really healthy states. So you can see here from the, the left to the right of the diagram that I've drawn, we've got hedgerows. We quite often see them now on the left-hand side, that poorly managed one that's been perhaps beaten and thrashed. And um, something's been flailed year after year at the same height, which means that you get these kind of scarred knuckles in the hedgerow and the hedgerow can't regrow, it can't regenerate. Um, and they get um, scrubbier and scrubbier and more and more scraggly until eventually they disappear and you get hedgerows with holes in and eventually no hedgerow at all that might be replaced by a fence. And then as we move from the left to the right of the diagram, you can see it just gets a little bit bushier. So this is, as management perhaps would improve, um, if you stopped, if you took the pressure off of that flailing, if you cut it a little bit less, if you did some hedge lane and um, perhaps some coppice in, you could uh, weave some more plants in there, some more of those, um, those trees and um, bushes. And as you get along there, you can see that this, this hedgerow goes bushier, it becomes more billowing and more, textured and deep and just for me really exciting that hedgerow on the right for me is something that's complex it's it's just full of opportunity to find really cool things um and there's some plants in there as well i've tried to draw hawthorn which has been quite difficult um but i've drawn that's supposed to be 
uh, hawthorn blossom, not like mashed potato or something. Um, and then dog rose as well, which is one of my favorite hedgerow plants, the gorgeous pink flowers of dog rose that later in the year turn into those gorgeous red rose hips. And if you've ever had rose hip um, syrup, I highly recommend it. It's a gorgeous um, thing to forage from hedgerows in autumn this time of year. So you can see here, as that complexity increases in the hedgerow, as that texture increases, if you just look at it, it's got all of these nooks and crannies, it's got shadows, it's got depth, it's got all of these, all of these different places for wildlife to hide. The more of that texture and the more complexity a hedgerow has, the wider of diversity of life that it supports, the more wildlife can, can live in there. And if you think that's because there's more food plants, so there might be more trees, there might be more shrubs, there might be more other things. Um, that means there's more wildflowers, it means there's more insects that then come to those plants. So whether it's insects that are pollinators or it's insects that feed on the leaves or insects that create galls or bore into the wood, all of that insect and invertebrate diversity will then attract a host of predators. So you get all sorts of things, you know, from bats flying over hedgerows in the evening to mammals, you get voles and things living in the lower edges of the hedgerows. Dormice, as we'll hear in a little bit from Ian, all the way through to bird life. And bird life for me, I am a bird nerd, but as I mentioned before, I'm a nerd of all things. But for me, bird life is the true canary in the coal mine. The presence or absence of a bird can show you a little bit about the environment that it's in and the quality it is. Um, and some of our head, some of our birds that have really particular niches like hedgerows, um, when they're present, it shows you that there's some good habitat nearby. So we're going to delve a little bit into some of them. Now here's some characters. Um, I'm sure many of you can name lots of these. Um, but all of these birds you might find in a place where there's rich hedgerows and really good quality hedgerows. Some of them are much more common than others. Some of them are much more generalist than others. So things like the blackbird and the robin, um, you can find in many urban places, in gardens, in parks. And then other ones are really quite particular and fussy. And some of these have declined quite a lot by quite a significant percentage. Um, but each of them will need something different. And a hedgerow will provide something different. A really good hedged landscape will provide something different. All of that variety, all of that texture supports um, a different bird. So if we look at this hedgerow again, and I'm looking at the good one for now, if we start at the bottom, here at the bottom, if you've got some long vegetation, if you've got some bushiness, you might be providing the perfect habitat for a bird like the corncrake. Now, the corncrake has all but disappeared from England. There are a couple of reintroduction schemes, but it's pretty much extinct from most of England. There's a few um, populations holding on in areas of Scotland, particularly on the islands, um, where um, management of, of farmland has meant that these birds can hang on. And that's because they need that deep vegetation um, I'll get into the corn crake in a little while, but when they fly and they migrate all the way back here from the warmer climes, they arrive in spring and they need somewhere to hide when they arrive where the males will just call incessantly throughout the night. Um, and the fact that a lot of this cover is reduced now because of modern farming methods and we, we um, cut fields quite often every year and we also have a lot less messiness um, and a lot fewer hedgerows, there's fewer places for these birds to hide and from that we've seen a complete you know, really catastrophic collapse in corn crates, beautiful bird. Again, with grey partridges, another bird that, um, for example, the grey partridge is a ground nesting bird. They lay a clutch of eggs and they need some kind of hollow under shelter to lay their eggs in, which is perfect under a hedgerow. If you think of that nice little sheltered dark area under a hedgerow, it's perfect for birds like the grey partridge to lay their, their eggs. And again, these birds have declined a lot. We still have them in England, but they're isolated for pockets that have largely been lost. Um, and I only saw my first as an adult a few years ago when, when visiting Norfolk, so you really don't see that many anymore. If we take a few steps up, just go up a few inches, so not quite on the ground, but a little bit higher up in that hedgerow, what does, what does that support? So you might get really common birds like the robin. People don't realise that robins actually generally nest really low down, even almost on the floor. And other birds, warblers like chiff chaffs, are very low nesters. They can be at knee height or below. Um, so not all birds nest high up in trees like we tend to think in storybooks. Birds have taken advantages of different heights in flora. So if you've got a scrubby underlayer in that hedge, that bushiness, then you'll support birds like robins and chip chaffs and other things like that. A little bit higher up again in the middle of the hedgerow, medium size hedgerow, a couple of metres or so. This is where the, the warblers really love because warblers tend to be scrub lovers. Now this is a lesser white throat, but other warblers like black caps, uh, common white throats, 
Willow Warblers, things like that, really love kind of scrubby messiness. They absolutely thrive in it. And so if you've got some a hedgerow with a diverse height, you've got a little bit of low bit, middle bit, high bit, you're going to get birds that take advantage of all of those different heights. And again, things like the yellow hammers. Yellow hammers absolutely love the sweet spot for them is a two meter hedge. That's what all of the conservation advice says for a yellow hammer. So if you've got a hedgerow that's got some areas of two meter patches, you're going to get this gorgeous little bird singing. And it does look like a true canary. I absolutely love yellow hammers and we'll get to their song in a little bit. And then other things like finches, I've picked the bullfinch here, but other finches will nest at that kind of medium height in the middle of a bushy hedgerow. They build really gorgeous woven little nests out of grass and moss. And then higher up at the top of the hedgerow or even in hedgerow trees, which are a really important feature, um, you get higher up nests. So thrushes, I've drawn the blackbird here, but things like missile thrushes and song thrushes will nest higher up in hedgerows. Um, and they're also quite early nesters as well. They tend to nest before the greenery comes in. So they're a little bit higher up to get out of the way of predators. And things like the turtle dove. Now they, they need a higher hedgerow than a yellow hammer. Yellow hammers have declined by quite a lot. Turtle doves have declined by even more. It's over 90% um, decline of the turtle dove. And these guys need higher hedgerows, really dense, thick ones. So quite often, if you're near a turtle dove, you'll hear them purring, hear that amazing noise. Um, but you'll never see one because they're right in the depths and the shadows of this, this hedgerow up at the top. And of course, things like kestrels. Now, kestrels will nest in trees in hollows. Um, and if there's a hedgerow tree, that's a perfect spot for them. But I'm using this as a kind of segue because of all the bird life that hedgerows support, it's predators. So I've dropped the barn owl in there as well. Now, barn owls need um, kind of bigger hollows to nest in. So whether it's a big hollow in an old tree or barn, as the name suggests, things like barn owls and kestrels will love a hedgerow and they'll use those linear features in the landscape almost as roads to hunt along. You'll see them following them um, and from there they'll be hunting their small mammalian prey so things like voles and mice. So you can see here I've by no means covered all of the bird life that hedgerow supports but I've tried to give that kind of mix of everything from you know the common stuff that we find in our garden and things like um, finches, things like robins, things like blackbirds, all the way through to really kind of specialist um, what we call farmland birds or those scrub loving birds things like turtle doves, yellow hammers, corn crates, grey partridges. There's such a diverse array of feathered life that can be supported by hedgerows. Um, and yeah, this, this is just a little bit of a, a, a pick of some of my favourites, if you will. So we'll do a little bit of a, um, a bird song lesson. Now, hopefully my bird song will play. Um, if not, can somebody please interrupt me and let me know. Um, we're going to start with the blackbird. Now, this is a really nice common... Um, um, songster. It's got a really deep and melancholy tone. Um, it can quite often sing at night. And for me, it reminds me of an old man whistling. So um, I like to picture my granddad pottering around at the edge of the garden and um, whistling away a tune to himself as he goes. He sings for a little bit and pauses, and then he sings for a little bit and then pauses. So we'll just have a listen to the blackbird. In like a few weeks since I've heard that and oh it does something to my soul. So you can hopefully hear that that melancholy tone and that singing and the pause and the sing and the pause almost at the same tone as a human whistle that kind of really lovely to listen to. Uh, the next one we'll cover is the robin. Um, now, I've picked the robin and the blackbird because these are the most common songsters you're likely to hear in any urban area or um, rural area. Um, see, it's Louise. So hope... just, it's just Louise. Hi, it's Louise. Just to say, I don't think where the rest of us are getting the sound on that, just to Ooh. give you a little okay. heads up. Yeah. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, <laughs> okay. Advanced sharing options. How can I share? Do you know how I can share sound? Uh, let me have a little look. Share yeah, sound, found it. Great, I'll okay, give it another go. Robin, take two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll cover the robin. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. I thought you could hear it. Um, okay, so the robin um, is a similar one to the blackbird, um, which you didn't hear, but hopefully you heard my, my impression of it. Um, and uh, I like to compare it to the blackbird in that it's got a really sweet and lovely tone. So if it's um, 
if the granddad is the blackbird and the little kid following it around is the robin. So it's almost like the grandchild imitating granddad doing that whistling song. And these guys sing year round. I heard one singing this morning um, and they can sing at night as well. I heard one again this morning at about five in the morning in the pitch black singing away. So even though they sound sweet and lovely, um, they do like to keep you up in the middle of the night. And again, they've got that very similar structure, singing, pausing, singing, pausing. Hopefully you can hear it now. Yes, we can hear. And I just I just think it's gorgeous. Again, it's another sound that just brings me joy. Um, now the song thrush, this is a song, this is a bird. The song is in the name. It sounds like, like loads of birds mushed together. Song thrush, it's a thrush of song. Um, and it almost sounds like it's stolen loads of different phrases from different birds and it's just kind of testing them out. So it's a little bit indecisive. So we'll pick a phrase and then I'll repeat that phrase two, three or four times and I'll move on to the rest. We'll have a listen. They're just, just wonderful to listen to. So they have a similar kind of tone of voice to that blackbird, but they just mix it up and make all of these different ridiculous noises. They blow my mind every year. And then if we cover a bird that is an iconic hedgerow songster, now this is one of my favourite bird songs because it's memorable, it's ridiculous, it gets stuck in your head. It's not the most beautiful, but it's just wonderful to hear. And when you hear one, you know that there's a gorgeous little canary looking bird like this yellow hammer sat in a hedgerow somewhere and he's singing away. And that's where they often sing from, perch right at the top of the hedgerow. So what you've got to do for this one is think about both bread and cheese. So hopefully you've already had your tea and you won't be too hungry. Um, because it's got a little phrase that he sings, the male yellow, the yellow hammer. And that is a little bit of bread with no cheese. Now bear with me because I'm going to do a terrible impression. It goes something a little bit like this. A little bit of bread with no cheese. And you'll listen. <laughs> bear with me and if I have to play, you'll hear what I mean. <laughs> Get one more. I'll play it again. So it's that really high pitch noise, and this is a song that has gone down in folklore for ages because it's been such an iconic sound of our countryside. A little bit of bread, no cheese. It's been passed down generation and generation, and sadly. This bird is now becoming a lot rarer, so it's a song I'm not as familiar with, which is just heartbreaking because it's just wonderful. It brings me joy. And another one, I promised I'd cover the corn crake before. Now, this little weirdo, I only saw for the first time in my life this year. Um, I'd heard one before, but I hadn't seen it. Um, and that just goes to show how rare they are. Um, so I get full adult age and not have heard or seen one of these birds. Um, and I didn't expect it because it just turned up where I live on the Isle of Butte on the West Coast. Um, and I sent a recording to my local bird group and everybody lost their minds. Um, and it had not been seen here for 13 years. So even on this island, you know, they've almost completely, well, they have completely disappeared. Um, so, so this is a sound that's almost disappeared for most of England. A couple of reintroduction sites, as I said, but you largely will not hear this anymore. And this used to be a noise that people were kept up by all night. It's a repeater call that goes round and round. And the Latin name of the bird, Crexpex, is, oh, I can't say this word, onomatopoeic. Um, so basically its name is what it says. So you've got to imagine for this one, a plastic comb. If you imagine strumming your nail or your finger along a plastic comb and that noise it makes, that's exactly what a concrete sounds like. Just have a listen to this. Absolutely bizarre, mechanical almost. And so as soon as I heard that, I was cycling along a full pelt. I heard it and I almost fell off my bike because I was like, I know exactly what that noise is. It's a plastic comb, it's a corn crate. And it was. 
Um, so if you hear that noise, it's, it's very exciting. It means concrete in the area, which are just remarkable, weird, chicken looking little birds. Um, so that's a little lesson in bird song. Um, I've come to the end now. I'm sorry, I've slightly overrun with my technical difficulties. Um, but just one little thing I wanted to tell you about. As part of National Hedgerow Week this year, um, Chris Packham has um, launched a new competition, which we'd love as many people to take part in as possible. Um, this is going to run for a whole year, so you don't have to immediately rush out. But we basically want people to nominate their favourite hedgerows, the ones that bring life and joy and excitement. Um, and there's prizes to be won as well. You can win your own hedgerow and, and other things. Um, and all you've got to do is go out and take a photo of it and submit it to the website. And we can celebrate it year round. So it can be when the berries are out, when the um, honeysuckle's out, when the blossom's out. We just want people to really celebrate those hedgerows. So please do check out that website if you've not heard about it already. And that's me. So thank you very much. I will um, check the Q&A, but I'm not sure. Are we answering questions now or at the end? I think we'll do them uh, at the end. And at the moment, the Q&A is quiet, so. Uh, thanks very much, Lucy. That was a great hedgy tour of, of birds and birdsong. And welcome, Ian, who I hope um, you've had time to uh, get a little calmer after all your technical problems. Yep, thank you. Uh, hopefully it will work. So if I just move in and share my screen. So you missed my introduction to you, but I was saying that you've been um, Dormouse uh, Officer for People's Trust for Endangered Species for, for 16 years or more. So you know more than almost anyone about Dormice. Looks like Ian may have still a few gremlins. With apologies, everybody, Ian has been struggling um, with his internet connections. So Louise is saying, if, if, if anybody does have any questions that they'd like to ask Lucy in the meantime, why don't you pop them in the Q&A, which might give Ian a little bit of time to uh, reconnect. So I can see there's a, a, a question actually in from Loretta in the chat. Is do you have any idea of the population numbers for corn crake, Lucy? Um, I don't off the top of my head. Um, I wouldn't want to make up any figures either. <laughs> um, I just know that. Um, yeah. So the, the funny thing about corn crake is that they are, are extremely um, site faithful in terms of their um, uh, migration. So if you, you lose corn crake from an area, you've lost the living memory of that area. So it's very unlikely that um, naturally corn crake would recolonize that area anytime quickly. Um, because the offspring from say say there's a say there's corn crake on the Isle of North Uist, and they raise some chicks, and then those chicks then migrate to Africa. And then when they migrate back, they're going to go back to North Uist because that's all they know. It's ingrained kind of um, magnetically in their heads. So they're not just, unless they get lost, they're not just going to run and they recolonize Southern England, for example. Um, so once that decline started happening and corn crakes were lost from a lot of areas in, in England, that was it. It was that living memory was lost, sadly. Um, so some of the reintroduction projects that they're trying to do. Um, involves imprinting concretes geographically on new places. So raising them in a place that's like in the Midlands and then making sure they know it's in the Midlands. So then they'll come back to it is the hope when there's um, obviously hand in hand with sufficient habitat restoration as well. So I'm not sure about the exact numbers. I just know that they're categorically not in most areas of England and Wales. Um, and in Scotland, the, their stronghold tends to be in the um, the Western Isles, where there's still quite a lot of those traditional farm and practices, meadow management. Oh, I can see that um, there's a question. Lucy, do people often ask you what your favourite bird is? Is it the corn crake or is it? <laughs> um, all the time. And you, you think it was lapwing after me using loose ah, lapwing on my social media. Of course. Um, 
I always answer it with my top five because I find that that's easier to deal with. Um, so my top five birds are the dipper, which I just adore, um, swifts, um, kestrels, uh, lapwings, and nightjars. I just, I'm obsessed with nightjars. They're, they're unashamed weirdos. I think they're brilliant. Oh. And, and Andrew has, is asking, what are the best things we can plant at home if we have space to help with the decline of UK wildlife? Um, I would go as far as to say I could save you a job, Andrew, and I wouldn't even recommend planting anything um, because the best thing you can do is let nature plant itself. Um, so if you've got any kind of, you know, if you're somewhere near any kind of source of natural seed, you'll be surprised what turns up if you just let go. Um, it's kind of just like a mini rewilding that you can do. So if you, you know, clear an area of soil and just see what establishes itself, um, a lot of things that we really tend to dislike in our gardens, things that are classed as, and I don't like using this word, but weeds, I don't think weeds exist, but weeds. Um, weeds are so often our own native wildflowers. Um, so even things that we really don't, don't like, like nettles, um, nettles are brilliant for loads of butterflies, things like peacock butterflies, which are arguably one of the most beautiful. They're caterpillars eat nettles, which is just amazing. Um, things like teasels and thistles, they might spike you and they might be uncomfortable but things like goldfinches love to eat the seeds of thistles and teasels and goldfinches are beautiful so if you let you know nature play its course and just see what turns up not only is it quite exciting to identify the plant life that turns up but you also get all the associated insects and birds that would choose to be with it will be there rather than having to spend money going to a garden center save it and just see what happens Great idea. And, and Louise has added in here, if you have bare garden boundaries with fences or walls, you can always plant a hedge. How did I miss that? Um, a question, another question. Do yellow hammers overwinter? Uh, yes, they do. Yes. Um, I think they might be one that migrates a little bit, but I don't entirely know. Um, but yeah, you see, you see um, there was a farm when I, I used to live in the Midlands near me that was a an organic um, seed farm and they would do like winter seed scatters of, um, of mixes uh, to help the birds because um, there was one of the few populations of tree sparrows left in the area so I remember going for a walk on Christmas day in 2020 actually so, yeah 2020 yeah in lockdown year um, going for a walk near my house and seeing this cloud of um, finches and um, uh, buntings as well so the were reed buntings and yellow hammers, which are a type of bunting, um, and then goldfinches and chaffinches, and it was just oh, it's um, all scoff in the sea. Uh, talking with sparrows, there's another question about are sparrows interested in hedgerows? Very much so, yes. And I was going to put sparrows in, but I didn't have a drawing of one already, so um, and I didn't have time to do one. So sorry, uh, I think it's Patty who asked that. Um, yes, so yeah, both types of sparrow that we get here in the UK. Uh, well. We have three things that we call sparrows, but one of them is not a sparrow. We have the hedge sparrow, which is the dunnock, which isn't a sparrow. And then we have tree sparrows and house sparrows. Now house sparrows will like a hedgerow, but they also live quite close to humans, hence house in the name. Tree sparrows are the ones that um, really can benefit from hedgerows um, uh, in rural areas in particular, and they decline by quite a lot yet yeah, again. So um, yes, they do. They, you know, you've probably walked past the hedgerow and heard loads of bickering and arguing. It's always a bunch of house sparrows um, getting in a tiff isn't it so yeah they do they love it for the shelter there's an amazing uh hedgerow i mean i live i live in inner city i'm in in the east end of london and there's a beautiful old hedgerow that's been allowed to just grow wild and it overhangs and you can see people stopping and they crouch down actually underneath the branches because if you do that there's like an orchestra in this hedge and it's such a glorious thing to stand there for a few minutes and immerse yourself in it Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Like hedgerows, as much as they're a human managed um, feature, they are they are creating a kind of microcosm of what would be a natural habitat. So, if you think about lots of large mammals moving through a landscape in the past, in you know, in natural um, habitat in the UK before humans intervened, they would have been clearing space all the time. Things like boar and cattle, and you know, things like aurochs, which is a giant extinct type of cow, would have cleared space. And from that, new plants would have colonised. So you would have had these young, thorny scrub plants coming up, which were effectively hedgerows. So lots of our bird life is, is evolved alongside it. Um, so it makes sense that when we do have a hedgerow, it just is hustling and bustling with life. 
So I'm just looking. Uh, Andrew says, thanks, Lucy. I've been leaving patches of nettles and brambles. Just wanted to check I was doing the right thing. Definitely, yes. Um, and the thing is with nettles and brambles as well, um, they're good for you because they're edible. You know, brambles, you get your, your blackberries, gorgeous. You can make all sorts of stuff out of that. Nettles are one of our most edible foods. You can make nettle soup. Um, the seeds, you can kind of treat like a quinoa um, and eat that. And it's a really high protein kind of almost grain replacement. And um, you can use them in all sorts. So it's not just us that, it's not just wildlife that it benefits. You know, if you're willing to have these plants that some people regard as ugly, I think they're beautiful. Um, you can also, you know, have a tasty snack as well. I think I can see I'm I'm getting uh, fee some some information from backstage, if you like, that Ian is very much struggling. I think his internet connection is uh, completely not working. So I think unless anybody has any final questions for Lucy, uh, then we should thank you so much, Lucy, for um, your wonderful talk and for answering everybody's questions. And um, it's a great shame, but apologies that, that Ian couldn't join us. But thank you to Team Tree Council as well behind the scene, to Louise and Will, who've helped put um, this series for National Hedge Week, Hedgerow Week together. And thank you to you, all of us, all of you who've joined us this evening and uh, shared your questions of, of where, where you're joining us from and so on. So thank you, Lucy. Have a really great Hedgerow Week. <laughs> Thanks, you too. We'll see you Thanks, again. everyone. And don't forget, everybody, to have a go at the hedgerow um, of the year competition. The link is in the chat and uh, it's going to be really great. So, thank Thanks, you. Have a nice weekend. Yeah. Bye.